Good afternoon, everyone. Move this down a little. Thank you for being here. Uh, this is a nice group. I, I, this is one of the first times I attend a support group, so uh, I see a lot of familiar faces, and that's great. Uh, you guys are looking and doing great, and you know you inspire us every day, uh, especially with our um, Facebook group. Uh, you know that's that's gotten to be a really neat group, and we love seeing people's success stories and and just kind of some of the the questions and the discussions that arise. So. So you are very much an inspiration to all of us. Keep up the great work, and uh, you know when you get fantastic results, um, you know maybe or maybe not. You'll need one of these fancy surgeries with the fancy word paniculectomy. Actually, the 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 word is much more complex than the surgery itself. Once you see it, uh, it's it's fairly straightforward. And so this presentation isn't going to drag on for a long time. We're just going to kind of hit the high points. I brought some before and after pictures, which we all love, and then I actually have some footage from a surgery itself. And uh, you know, the real what I really want to get to is the Q and A because um, if you're interested in this, or if you know somebody that is interested, this is a great time to kind of ask and see. You know, who qualifies? Uh, you know, does insurance cover it? How much does it cost? What's the downtime? What are the details? So, I'd be happy to cover all of that. Okay, so. Um, there we go. Okay, so why would someone need a skin removal surgery? Um, actually, you would think it would be more common uh, with our patients, but we have noticed that there's more or less about a 10% uh, rate of um, patients seeking skin removal surgery. I do think that this number is actually higher, but I, I know that there are barriers to obtaining skin removal surgery, and probably the biggest one is, is uh, financial. Okay? This is not typically a covered surgery under any insurance plan because it's considered cosmetic, and therefore I think while many patients maybe that need one would like to get one, that's not always uh, possible due to finances because this, this ends up being something that has to be paid out of pocket. However, I will say that for our patients, uh, for years, you know, we did try to obtain insurance approval. We would take pictures, we would write letters, and every time it was a denial, it was no, 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 it's cosmetic. And so we said, well, what are we going to do? You know, this is something that the patients uh, definitely need, and for many of them, uh, a lot of the centers that offer this type of surgery were, were far out of the reach. So we decided as a practice to uh, that we, we do not seek insurance approval. It's just not worth our time because it ends up in a denial. However, we do offer it at a very discounted rate. We can talk about those details. So, these are tissues, skin, subcutaneous tissues, the dermis, and subcutaneous fat that will not respond to anything you do. So, as my partner Dr. Hamilton says, no lotion, potion, or cream is going to take this away. And many patients ask me, say, well, should I do some exercise? And I tell them, absolutely. You should always do exercise to stimulate lean muscle mass and to make sure that the muscles underneath are getting toned. You need that for your posture. You need that for movement. Uh, so it's always a great idea. However, please do not uh, be, um, uh, do not have the expectation that you are going to burn that those excess rolls of skin off at the gym. It's just not going to happen. This is skin that has been stretched out. We refer to the skin as the skin envelope, and I think that that's a good term for it because if you think about it, it is truly like an envelope. And for years, when that was uh, very stretched out because of all of the adipose, all the fatty tissue, when that tissue goes away the skin envelope doesn't automatically retract. We have seen in some patients, uh, younger patients, usually males, um, when the weight loss is under 75 pounds, they will typically kind of, their skin will bounce back. But the, the common thing is that the skin doesn't automatically bounce back and then you end up with some rolls. However, we like to say that this is a good problem to have. It just means that you have fantastic weight loss results and you know that the weight loss results give you health, give you all kinds of benefits, the non-scale victories. And so this is a problem that is relatively easy to fix after everything you've already been through. So um, 
some of the risk factors, I guess you would say, is high amounts of weight loss. So if you lost more than 100 pounds, uh, definitely you'll probably have a higher risk of having excess skin. Anything higher than that, you're almost guaranteed to have excess skin, okay? Um, women, this is a little bit more common in women, and in, in older women, it is also more common. If you've had multiple pregnancies, or if you've had twin pregnancies, or if in any of your pregnancies, uh, you had a very large uh, baby that, so you were, you know, one of those bellies that was really stretched out and you had stretch marks, that means that your skin is at higher risk of, of having uh, of excess skin with weight loss. Uh, and there are different skin types. We won't get into all those details, but uh, as you know, I mean, you've met people and you tell them, oh, you have amazing skin. You know, you can just see that there are skin differences. And so some people's skin does, has more elastin in it. That's and, and the elastin allows the uh, skin to bounce back and regain its shape. And so, uh, according to your skin type, you may have a higher risk of having excess skin. And certainly, the part of the body that is most affected and that most people want treated is the belly, okay? What we call the panis, the abdominal panis. And that's why they call the surgery paniculectomy. It is kind of that apron that hangs over the pubic bone, okay? and it can cause a lot of rashes, ulcers, pain. Uh, it can limit mobility and how you move. Uh, a lot of patients complain of back pain because you know, it changes, it changes your balance. You know, you're used to walking around and when you lose weight and now the skin hangs, it actually changes how you move and it can start affecting your back. But it, it, you know, as you know, the arms is also a very common area that's affected, the thighs, the breasts as well. And so, uh, if you need all those areas removed or tightened, that can be done. Um, we focus here on the paniculectomy, and that's what we're going to talk about today. But certainly there are surgeons that will do what's called a full body lift, where they will combine multiple procedures uh, if the patient desires it and needs it. And so that can be done. So this is what a typical excess redundant panis looks like, okay? This is somebody that uh, lost uh, over 150 pounds after a gastric bypass. And what you see here is this kind of apron of tissue that hangs. And what you see up here, it's like a superior role. And so patients often say, I want to get rid of this, but what about this? And what I tell them that, that the idea is, is that the only reason that, like this is kind of puffed up and, and redundant is because this is in the way. Once we remove all this tissue below the belly button, that gives us a chance to stretch that tissue up there down, okay? Now that's a traditional, what's known as the tummy tuck. There are some differences between an abdominoplasty and a paniculectomy. For the most part, we plan on doing paniculectomies, and if we can, we go ahead and do a full abdominoplasty. If there's room to remove enough skin, to reimplant the belly button, tighten the muscles if needed. So uh, that it's we consider it kind of the same surgery and we'll try to get you the best, not just functional result, but the best cosmetic result, really at the same price. But there are some patients that don't have enough skin to actually detach the belly button, fix the muscles. All they require is removal of that apron and that's a true paniculectomy. Um, so uh, there are other situations. If you're looking for a you know flawless, superb cosmetic result with lines everywhere, that can be done, you know, that's a much, much different surgery and a much different price, but there are some cosmetic surgeons that will remove all the skin and then they will get in there and suck a lot of this out with liposuction to leave lines. We don't do that, okay? We focus on removing the skin that is causing, like I said, the ulcers, the rashes, a lot of the functional difficulty, and uh, this allows us to do the surgery fairly quickly with minimal downtime. But, you know, there are those other, uh, procedures available, and usually that's north of $15,000 or more, okay? So that's not something we focus on here. We, our, our philosophy is we want, we want to get you back in function as soon as possible and uh, do something that's affordable for you as well. So this is, once again, somebody that has very, kind of very classic apron. You know, you can see here that they've, they've lost a great amount of weight. There's not a lot of fat here. But this is a class, so this would easily respond to just kind of taking this uh, excess skin right there, okay? And so this is kind of what I was alluding to. If you look at some of the 
um, you know, medical textbooks, they'll tell you that paniculectomy is really just functional. It's just removing the, the panis that's, that's hanging over the pubic bone to reduce ulcerations, whereas a, uh, and it doesn't address the upper part, whereas an abdominoplasty is more of a cosmetic operation where they're doing everything, repairing muscles, reimplanting the belly button, sometimes combining it with liposuction. I think I would say we do a hybrid of these uh, because for 90% of our patients, I think we do a full abdominoplasty. Not every patient requires muscle repair, but usually there's enough tissue there to have to reimplant the belly button and give a nice um, uh, flat configuration. As you can see here, this is what a tummy tuck does. This is the old belly button that's been carved out and reimplanted, and then all of this below the line is going to get removed. So, who uh, is a candidate? Um, we like to say that you need to be at least a year out from surgery, okay? Because uh, we want to make sure that you are still not losing weight, okay? Also, we want to make sure that you're not regaining weight, okay? So. Uh, a stable weight for about three to six months. If you're at least a year out from surgery, that's a great candidate. And if you have any, now, now these are not required, okay? You don't have to have demonstrated ulcers or back pain. If you come and say, you know, I feel great, but I just, you know, I don't like this, uh, we'll, we'll do the surgery. You don't have to have ulcers, but these are great reasons to get it done as well. This is a big one, okay? Uh, as we told you with your weight loss surgery, this is the same for skin removal surgery. Absolutely no smoking. Smoking impairs wound healing. This is not a surgery where you want to have trouble with wound healing because your wound goes from up here to up here. It's a big wound and it'll heal very nicely, but you got to give your body the best chance. So absolutely no tobacco products, okay? We're very adamant about that. And we just want to make sure that you're able to follow post-op instructions. I think we trust our patients really well after having undergone, you know, the bariatric surgery. We know, we know that you guys are motivated, that you can follow instructions, so this is typically not a problem. The instructions aren't very tedious, but we do tell you some postural things that you have to do. You know, everything's tight, so you're going to have to walk hunched over. You're going to have to sleep in a recliner for a bit. We want you wearing that binder. Don't peek, okay? Just leave it nice and tight. We want to make sure that you can take care of those drains that you're going to take home. We'll go over all that, but but uh, we give you plenty of instructions, and they're really not that hard to follow. So, some before and afters here. Uh, once again, excellent weight loss after a gastric bypass. This patient also had a previous scar from a hysterectomy, and this is kind of a nice uh, plus if uh, many women who have lower abdominal scar, C-section, hysterectomy, that will actually. Go away we'll get rid of it in the same surgery so uh, so you'll get the removal of the skin but you'll also get uh, a nice uh, flat look here so this is and this patient tans so that's why there's obvious color difference but but um, the scar is really you know well hidden as you can see this is where she wears her bathing suit and so the scar is hidden underneath that line uh, her belly button has been re-implanted, and this is the profile look. So all of this was literally gone in one surgery, okay? So great uh, cosmetic results. What's the recovery like? Um, we are a uh, same-day uh, surgery center for paniculectomy, so you do not need to spend the night. Uh, we, like I said, we do the surgery in such a way where you would think that because you have a really big incision, it would be very painful. But it's actually, in many cases, less painful than your laparoscopic surgery. In your laparoscopic weight loss surgery, we have to put those ports through your abdominal cavity. And uh, how many of you remember the left-sided pain? Yeah, so <laughs> that, that's a tough one. You know it. And that goes right through the muscle and the fascia. We, we use a stitch to close that. So if you remember how that, that was like a terrible charley horse on your left side, you won't feel that because we are staying above the fascia and the muscles, okay? This is just skin and subcutaneous tissues, and even though it's a huge incision, the pain is actually fairly minimal, okay? So most patients are only taking uh, oral pain meds for a little bit, and they're recovering at home, and they go home that same evening. Um, you will have a drain on each side. When you see the surgery, how it's done, you'll understand that in order to mobilize and be able to close that um, uh, incision, we're going to move everything from down here down here. You got to detach it from underneath. Okay, it's stuck to a lot of uh, underlying tissue. So 
when you detach it and you close it, that leaves a virtual space in your body, and your body wants to fill that with fluid. So if you don't use the drains or take care of them appropriately, you're going to accumulate fluid in there, and then the two tissues are not going to touch and scar down. And you'll end up with a sloshy collection of fluid that, you know, there's times where we've had to bring patients in, and then we've got to put a needle in the office and suck it out to flatten it down. Pretty rare if you wear your binder and you take care of the drains, but it can happen, and that's the reason why you will go home with two drains and we'll take one out at one week and the other one out at two weeks. Um, we want you kind of bent over at the waist, so I tell people kind of walk like, like this. Um, some people have a walker at home. You don't necessarily need one, but by the time you come at your one week visit, you're a little bit more upright, and when you come to your two week visit, the skin is kind of uh, um, uh, stretched enough to allow you to stand fully upright. But you don't want to be like changing light bulbs that first day, okay, because you'll, you'll tear something. It's pretty tight. And you want to sleep in the same position kind of the beach chair position, bent at the waist and bent at the knees. So a recliner with a pillow or a little uh, pillow roll underneath is fantastic, okay? And you will go home wrapped up in this big tight binder. And we want you to wear that for one week. Don't take it off, don't peep. Sponge bathe around it. And when you come to the office at one week, we'll take it off for you, we'll change the dressing, and then we'll wrap it back on. And you wear it for another week, and then you come back in two weeks. After two weeks, you can take the binder off, but I recommend that everybody go on Amazon and buy those tummy tuck garments, okay? You can look them up as tummy tuck panties, tummy tuck garments, but they are much more comfortable in that big binder, and you can just kind of put them on over your underwear. Some of them have a side zipper, some of them have a little latch underneath, but they are really tight, and they will compress everything, and we would like for you to use those for up to six weeks. That really leaves you with a nice flat contour and prevents fluid accumulation. And we'll see you at one and two weeks, and then we'd like to see you at six months just to get a real good look at how everything is healed and get some before and afters. Most patients can go back to work to a desk job in about two weeks, but if you can take more time, four weeks is probably better. Once again, not because you're in pain, you can hardly move, just gives you a chance to you know, focus on recovery. If you have a physical job, you will definitely require at least four weeks, okay? Because bending, twisting, lifting, you don't want to be stretching that out ahead of time, okay? So um, another before and after. So see, I mean, uh, you know, there's many patients who are like hiding this in their jeans or, or in their underwear, okay? And when you look at a profile shot, you can see it kind of flattens it out, but if she were to take this, it, she has a big apron here. and so. This is an after, so bef before and after, before and after. Look at the scar. Um, you know, if you, if I didn't point it out for you, you'd have a hard time really seeing it. So it's really, while it is a long incision and scar, over time the body smooths it out and kind of uh, uh, changes it to about the same color. So really great cosmetic results. Okay, like I had said before, this is generally not covered by insurance. We offer it here for a price of $5,000, okay, that's everything included, that's uh, surgeon, operating room, uh, your visit, uh, anesthesia, the only thing that this doesn't include is extra time in the OR, so these are scheduled for about an hour, but as you saw some patients that have a lot, it's going to take a little longer than an hour, so the surgery center, we won't bill you extra, but the surgery center will, and they'll, and they'll tell you that up front, they're going to bill you for every certain time increment. Most of these can be done in about 90 minutes. Shouldn't really take much more than that. We'll tell you in the office, if it looks like it's a lot of tissue, we'll just say, well, this is gonna take longer, so you're gonna end up paying a little bit more, okay? But uh, for the most part, that 5,000 uh, deals with everything. And then there's very low rate of possible complications, but like with any surgery, uh, especially when you have a big raw surface like that, there's a chance of postoperative bleeding. The drains will tell us if you're bleeding, so just like with your with your other surgery, I always tell people, if there's any doubt, if there's any question, please call. Uh, we can answer the, the and reassure you, or we can have you come in. But you can tell us, if those drains are filling up, if they're looking pretty red, we need to know that because that may mean that, that you're having uh, prolonged bleeding. Wound infection, if the skin starts turning red, hot, puffy, hurting a lot, if you're getting some drainage, let us know. Uh, 
this is a big wound and so there certainly is a risk for that becoming infected and that can usually be dealt with with some uh, light uh, antibiotics and that'll take care of it but we don't want it to get worse um, you will have some staples closing the skin and sometimes those can come apart a little usually that's not a big deal if you have a little gap in the incision we'll tell you to pack it we'll have you come to the office and look at it but if the wound were to get infected and then you know, pus comes out and you're left with a big gap, then, you know, that's going to require something else. Uh, thankfully, you know, I can't remember the last time we saw something like that. So for the most part, uh, everybody does really well. The fluid accumulation that I mentioned, that's something that we'll be able to detect at your one and two week visit. Keep in mind that when you come to your one week, when you come to your two week, it's not going to look like it's supposed to look or like it will look at six months and at one year. Just like your weight loss surgery, you wanted to see the results right away, but it takes time. So this surgery also requires some time and patience as you recover and allow things to really take their shape. And then the last thing is the dog ear. And that's, I've heard it called a lot of things. I've heard it called it a horn. Some lady called it her side nipple, but it's where the, where the uh, incision comes together. Sometimes it's very hard to line up, especially in somebody where you're taking out a lot of uh, tissue. In order to get them completely straight, you almost have to go all the way back around, and that's hard to do. So we line it up as best as we can, but every once in a while, somebody's left with like the corner of the incision resembling like a little point, and we call those, you look in the books, they call them dog ears. Uh, if you have that, no problem. We can remove them in the office under local anesthesia. I typically don't charge patients to do that, and it's like a 10-minute little procedure just to remove that, and then and then it flattens out and you're good. So that's one of the potential things that can happen, but we know how to take care of it. So this is somebody that's gonna undergo a surgery and you can see here uh, just a large amount of uh, excess tissue. This is uh, kind of stretching it out. I would be planning to remove kind of everything under the belly button and above the pubis. So that mons pubis area can certainly get very full of fatty tissue and can be kind of hanging low and then we try to lift that up to give you a nice cosmetic look and this is seen from the side so you can just see how much excess skin this uh, patient had developed let me uh, connect this to sound here that she had a lot of excess skin so this can sometimes be an issue after weight loss surgery we like to say it's a good problem to have it means that you had great weight loss results and uh, this particular patient was having some back pain and some rashes that the excess skin was causing and so that's a good reason to get the skin removed so that's what we're going to do today you can see here I'm holding in my two hands the amount of excess skin that she has and so We'll make it an incision to remove this, we'll replant the belly button, and she'll have uh, excellent cosmetic results, and you know we'll stop having the back pain and the rashes. So uh, about 10 to 50 percent of our patients end up needing some sort of skin removal surgery, and that's something that we typically do about 12 to 18 months after the uh, initial weight loss surgery. So what I um, am doing here, I, uh, I typically will have patients in the pre-op area stand up so we can get kind of an idea, but I like to mark once we're in the room. And uh, what I'm marking here is kind of the middle, the midline, what we call, so from the, uh, from the uh, right under the breastbone to the belly button down to, in this area, her genitals, and everything is lining up, and then just trying to see how, you know, it's it's hard to go all the way down here. Uh, like I said, you'd have to go almost all the way to the back. So we try to remove as much as we can from the front and then start kind of making our marks there. And, uh, and, and then we remove everything within those marks. So that, that would be where I was uh, planning the incision. And uh, so it's like a big wedge of tissue that we're removing, okay? 
and this is kind of what she looked like once the marks were set. This is her head, this is her feet down here. So, So the white part is the fascia, so that's kind of the strength layer where the muscles are. And we're just removing this uh, excess tissue on top of it, okay? So it's just like raising a flap of tissue. Remove it and then bring the flap down and stitch it. You're completely asleep for this, obviously. It's general anesthesia. <laughs> <laughs> that's not a scalpel. That's called an electrocautery device. We use the scalpel on the skin, and then this is an electrocautery that dissects the tissue and, and uh, coagulates it at the same time. Very little bleeding. That's right. There's very little bleeding because the plane between the fascia and the subcutaneous fat is what's called avascular, so there's not blood vessels that run directly there. If you stay in the right plane, you're really not having much bleeding at all. So as you can see, we're kind of raising that flap and um, you know, it's basically just taking that superficial layer off. Somebody told me, uh, somebody was in the OR and, and I was kind of explaining it to them and they were like, uh, they're like, yeah, have you ever uh, hunted deer? I said, no, I'm not a hunter. It was like, when, you, uh, when you're uh, removing the skin from a deer, they said, that's exactly what you do. You're just taking that superficial layer off. That's what I just told them. It's identical to field dressing a deer. Oh, they field dressing, that's the word. There you go. So that's kind of, yeah, you just stay in that, that plane there, so. So this is after having removed all that segment. Now we're bringing the two, the two, uh, this is her head up here. This is her feet down here. And we're joining those lines that I drew initially. And that, that's a re-implanted belly button. I've already done that. But now it's basically just joining it with sutures, okay? These sutures that I'm using here, they're absorbable, all right? So these are not sutures that you're gonna have to have removed. You only have to have the skin staples removed, but this brings the two layers of tissue together and it's just like sewing, and if you sew, <laughs> okay, so that's basically just bringing the two ends and making them look nice and straight. This is, Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Oh, that's her, Ms. Krubner's counting, <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, so that's, that. there's there's not that much, that's why I said in, in the beginning, it's kind of fairly simple. Once you remove that tissue, it's just lining things up so they look very nice cosmetically, and, and uh, these are, uh, like I said, absorbable sutures. Um, what you can see here is the drain tube it's being uh, secured to the skin, and there's going to be one on the other side as well. Um, and that's what it looked like at the end. Wow. So if you can remember this patient that I was grabbing all that skin, that had those big lumps of skin, this is what it looks like at the end, okay? You have one drain here, one drain here, belly button, the head here, the feet here, but was really able to bring this mons pubis uh, region up, stretch it out, and then it does look like a big, you know, impressive incision, but if you remember the, that after picture of that patient, this will turn a nice pale white and you'll hardly be able to see it. I'm curious, how, how did you make the belly button? I mean, what, what did you, so the this, is her, this is her regular belly button. Uh, what I would have done, I'll go back. What I would have done is I would cut right around it like this, carve it out, and then the belly button is on a stalk. So you dissect it down and it's connected by like a tubular structure that has the blood vessels. You gotta preserve that. So you detach it and when you remove that tissue, you just see this little tube with the skin on top of the belly button. Then you bring that flap down, make a new hole for the belly button and just stitch it all the way around. Okay. And uh, yeah, so you basically make a hole here and then you feed it up like like this, and then you just connect it all the way around with stitches. So it ends up in the it ends up in the same place. But you know, if I would her belly button with how much skin we pulled down would have ended up down here 
if you don't detach it. Right. So this skin, where her belly button is now, used to sit up here. But now it's been pulled down, flattened out, we just created a knee opening for it. And that's it. All right, questions? How many have you done? Uh, I have to check numbers, but probably well over uh, in the hundreds. Now we do them a lot. Now, yeah. yeah. if you think, I mean, we we have about twelve thousand uh, uh, bariatric uh, cases that we've done over twelve thousand. So, um, you know, ten percent of that is is I'm not sure that we've reached the thousands, but we've done several hundred between uh, the three of us. So, uh, my partner's Dr. Holland, Dr. Hamilton. We all do them, so. And a couple of, does it also help with like back? Back pain? Yeah, that's. Oh, no, like back to back. Like. Oh, uh, okay, no, it, this will not address the fat rolls back here in your back, okay? This will just address the front. If you have a lot of back fat, there's something that's called a belt lipectomy, where they'll basically take everything here or you know, a full body lift. Uh, there is what's called a 360 a circumferential um, uh, lift, and you know, that is where they do the surgery, but then they have to turn you over and do the back and kind of pull everything up. So that surgery is several hours long and just much more complex. And you know, I w when, when I ask most patients, uh, and some do choose to have that done, very few though, most patients they say, I just want to get rid of this. I want to not have this big, like, you know, lumpy apron and, that I'm hiding in my pants, so. A couple people online asking if we do legs and arms. Uh, so we, we do not offer legs and arms. Um, we, or breasts. Uh, we can certainly refer those patients to uh, a cosmetic surgeon that can do that uh, if they want several areas done. Um, and, and, and we have, and some, some patients say, well, I just want to do this first, and then I'll see about doing the arms and the thighs later. It's, you know, I said, I can wear long sleeves, or you know, I'm not going to be wearing a, a swimsuit, but this just bothers me. And so they kind of will typically choose to address this first. Typically, uh, what's the age range of your patients? Um, it, you know, it varies. We've, if you look at our average age range for uh, our bariatric it kind of follows that same age range. So the average patient is probably in their 40s, mid-40s, but we've certainly done this on patients in their 60s uh, or younger patients that have great weight loss, you know, 20s or 30s. But the averages are going to be in their 40s or 40s. Anybody in their 70s? Well, I mean, it's, it's kind of just like the uh, bariatric surgery, right? We don't set an age limit. But we take each patient on an individual basis and we will sit with you in the office and say, you know, what what do you like to what would you like to obtain out from this? You know, what is your goal? Uh, is it is are you having terrible back pain? Is it limiting your mobility? You know, how do you want to look? Uh, do you care more about the cosmetic or just about the functional? And then we see how, you know. Not every 70-year-old is, is the same. I mean, we, we have some 70-year-olds that, you know, are active and that are doing quite a bit. And, and if they can tolerate uh, this procedure, then they're a good candidate. So we don't uh, rule anybody out just based on age. We take everybody on an individual basis. And if it's a good, if it's a good idea and a good fit, then, uh, then, you know, we'll agree to do the surgery. But we certainly... If we feel like we're not going to reach your expectations, like uh, you know, maybe some patient has an idea of what they look like, and they bring a magazine and say, "Well, you're probably not going to look like that." So let's you know, let's be real with expectations, and if and if we feel that we're going to meet those, then yeah. then we'll do it. Yes. Um, well, having the surgery affect like your BMI or, or? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, that's a great question. Um, this surgery, so if you saw how much... Uh, what was the question? The, the question was, will this affect your BMI? Uh, many patients feel like they're going to get a significant amount of extra weight loss from this. Uh, they're like, okay, I've lost weight. I wish I could lose that extra 20 pounds, but if I have my skin removal, I'll lose the extra 20 pounds. Actually, 
you'll be surprised and, and, and maybe a little disappointed that uh, it doesn't weigh that much because fat is very bulky, but it doesn't weigh as much. For instance, muscle is very small, but weight is very heavy. It's like lead. Fat is not, you know, five pounds of muscle is this big, five pounds of fat is this big. So that lady in the video that had a uh, uh, tremendous amount of skin, it was probably no more than seven pounds that were removed. No. But what, how much did she go down in sizes? Uh, I'd have to ask her, I don't, but yes, she definitely went down in sizes, yeah. Yeah. She had lost 175 pounds, so she definitely, even after the, the uh, tummy tuck surgery, she went down in size because now she could wear more, you know, flatter jeans. Uh, if insurance covers it, you guys run. Yeah, it, we've had a pretty much zero percent success rate with getting insurance to cover it. So we don't even seek insurance approval anymore. It's not something we're really willing to put energy into because uh, the yield on it is very poor. Um, it's going to take several phone calls, letters and hours, and they're going to stamp it, deny it. Because, and you know, we've been there, so we just don't even bother. Uh, you have hernias. Now, if you have a hernia, that's different. That that surgery is a hernia repair, and you know, I have done a hernia repair where I remove some excess skin. Ideally, it's surgeries that should be separated, but most insurances will cover a hernia repair. If you have a very big pannus where there's a lot of overhanging skin, sometimes that's a big hernia. And uh, that is not something that, that I offer or that we offer here. Usually we'll refer you to a hernia specialist because that's gonna require a big paniculectomy plus a complex hernia repair. Um, and and you know we know a couple of people here in the city that do that type of surgery, so we'll, we'll typically refer to something like that that's very complex. Um, um, okay. I, uh, no, I don't. I've referred patients to uh, to uh, Dr. Steve Lowry before for that. Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay, so if you, um, if I'm understanding you correctly, if you have a small hernia that's repairable within the paniculectomy, whatever that word is, um, you still do those. But if it's a larger hernia, you don't. Is that what that's, I'm saying? That's correct. If it's a larger hernia and, and the hernia is filling that all that skin, right. then we'll usually yes. refer that. But if it's a very small, uh, yeah, I mean, I would, it, you know, you can sign up for a colectomy and then, you know, we can just repair that hernia, sure. no problem during the same surgery. Yeah. Um, someone online asked, how long after giving birth would someone uh, have to wait for surgery? Um, so this is somebody that's had weight loss surgery. Uh, it, so we wait 12 to 18 months after weight loss surgery. If they've had a baby after weight loss surgery, we would really just wait until they've kind of recovered from childbirth and have the functional ability to undergo a surgery or the time again <laughs> with a new baby but um, it, it depends it also depends that they have a c-section because that that is going to make things more complex so if they've had a c-section then we're definitely waiting at least probably you know a year after that surgery to do a, a skin removal anybody else all right well we thank you so much for your attention this is your Right down the middle, two, two circles.